this is another question I, I had for you that I can't get my head wrapped around. Uh, it's just really hard to understand uh, how the U.S. economy is really doing. I think like p part of this is uh, election year type stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So there's all of these messages you can't trust, you know, traditional media. So, you know, like there's a certain cohort of the population. It's really awesome. It's never been better. It's been a great four years. And there's another portion of the population that the, this is a Biden led depression that we're in. And so like <laughs> finding some truth in the middle is, is really difficult. And so there, there's also like, there's a question of where are we now? How is the U.S. economy really doing? You mentioned a lot of confidence in consumer spending, people traveling. You also have high prices. You have U.S. housing is uh, incredibly unaffordable at this point in time. Mm -hmm. This is a this is a chart. This is one of the most unaffordable housing markets in U.S. history. Levels uh, below 100 have only been seen two times in 2006 and then in uh, 1990. So we've got incredibly unaffordable housing, um, you know, and then th we have other things like weird unemployment numbers uh, as well, you know, coming out. Here's a tweet. The three month unemployment rate average has risen to 4%. That's 50 um, BIPs above its 12 month low of 3.5% triggering something called uh, Saham rule, I believe. Saham, call it Saham. Okay. Yeah, Saham rule. Saham rule. And according to this, I don't know what Saham rule is. Maybe you could explain it to us, but this has accurately marked the start of every recession since 1950 with only one false positive. So there's a question of where are we in the US economy? Is it doing well? Is it not doing well? And are we getting ready to teeter into recession? Do you have any answers for us? Yeah, I'll give you an answer. I'll give you a thought or a take on it. And it, it, the it, we call it the K-shaped economy. You know, it's the letter K. Part of it's going up and part of it's going down. Um, how do we know which part's going up and which part's going down? The unfortunate reality is it's about it's based on income. So let me give you a disturbing statistic. Bankrate.com, which is a bank, uh, uh, a website that... Um, you know, monitors banks and helps people with uh, their banking, does a survey every year. And they ask people, if in an, if in an emergency, could you come up with $1,000 right away? And two thirds of the American public's answer is no. They wow. cannot come up with $1,000 in an immediate emergency right away. Mm -hmm. They'd have to borrow it from a friend or a family member, or they'd have to max out their credit card or something. But they, they just can't go to the ATM and withdraw $1,000 and say, OK, I need $1,000 because there's X emergency, um, whether it's a health emergency or your air conditioner breaks. Here, here's $1,000 and let's go fix it. Two thirds of the country can't do that. And that's very disturbing in that respect. So when you look at the economy with inflation going up and wages not keeping pace, those two thirds of people are really put behind the eight ball. And it mm -hmm. really, they, they have to struggle. You know, as I like to say, they shop at Dollar General or Dollar Tree, or they shop at Walmart. And they sit there and they go, well, if I want to buy this, because the price has gone up, then I can't buy something else. And they have to make those kind of decisions. The other third of the country is locked up at the airport going to Italy, mm. is buying homes, is enjoying themselves, is revenge spending. And so that's what you're starting to see in this economy. And what is the, now you could argue, hasn't that always been the case? Yes, but the difference is inflation. Inflation really, really hurts the bottom half of the country. And it it doesn't hurt the top half of the country as much because what doesn't the bottom half of the country also have? They don't have assets. They don't have a portfolio. They don't own crypto. They don't even own a home. They probably rent. Where the top half of the of the country probably has S&P 500 index funds, and they probably have a retirement account, and they probably own their own home, and they see the S&Ps up 18%, and they see while... Housing is unaffordable. Part of the reason that housing is unaffordable is that the uh, um, the prices are continuing to go up. Well, if you're a homeowner, you're not complaining about prices going up. If you're a home buyer, you're definitely complaining about prices going up. So they're in an okay position. So it's this imposition of inflation. This is why the president's approval rating is so bad, because Jeff Bezos gets one vote and somebody on public assistance gets one vote. And if two thirds of the public can't come up with $1,000 in an emergency, you bet they're going to be very angry about the economy. Mm. And the upper one third might look around and go, looks okay to me because it is okay for you. 
But it isn't okay for them until we get the inflation rate down and a lot more. And as I mentioned before, unfortunately, I'm not so sure that we are going to get the inflation rate down. So that that's a great take, by the way, Jim. And it, you know, it's important to get out of whatever bubble that we find ourselves in and, and, and realize that there can be multiple worlds playing out at once. And so... How does this end up? Does this like the does the U.S. economy pivot towards recession? Do you think, or is there a recession already in progress for kind of the 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 low part um, of of the K, and like it's good times ahead for the you know upper part of the K? And like then, how does this all resolve? Because we can't be K shaped forever, can we? No, we can't be K shaped forever. I I would say there's two ways you could pivot this. We could either see maybe I'm wrong and the inflation rate is returning back under 2%, and wages will continue to grow faster than the inflation rate. That's what happened from 2010 to 2020. So you could argue back then from 2010 to 2020, wasn't it sort of K-shaped? Yes. But the difference was those on the bottom end, every year they got a raise. That raise at least met inflation. So to use a tennis metaphor, they could hold serve every year. That when they went to Dollar Tree or Walmart, they bought exactly the same amount of stuff as they bought a year earlier. And the amount that they had to spend to do it, relatively speaking, after their wage increase was the same. They didn't get worse. They just kind of held serve. And then if you you get a raise and improve your lot in life, you you can move out of that category. Now they're not. What will get them back into that position is to get the inflation rate down. Now, maybe I'm wrong, and we do have the inflation rate go down quite a bit, and that will that will go a great way towards resolving that problem um, as well. Otherwise, I think that this problem will manif- will will continue to fester for a long time. Let me make a quick word about recession. There was an economist at MIT in the 1970s called Rudy Dornbusch, and he's very influential in Federal Reserve circles. And he had a very famous line that he said, that economic expansions do not die of old age, that they're murdered. Mm. And what he means by that is, if you look at every recession in the last 50 or 60 years, usually the recession comes about because something like COVID or the housing crash or a war in in um, the Middle East that you know 1990 that causes the price of oil to go up 400 percent in a week, which is what it did in August of 1990, went from 10 to 40 dollars. Um, and those type of things murder the U.S. economy. So, are we going to go into recession? My answer is no. We're not going to go into recession unless you tell me that something is going to happen and murder it. Middle East is going to spike the price of oil, a geopolitical crisis, you know, some kind of a crack up in the financial markets or something, or another pandemic that just shuts down the global economy, or something that we haven't foreseen that comes along. As I like to say, you know, I'm looking at my quote, my Bloomberg for my quotes, and they have these big red headlines. Mm. And this big red headline comes across the screen, and I go, oh shit, that just changed everything. (laughs) You know, that's what causes a recession is, is that headline. Now, to be fair, I thought that was about 15 months ago, Silicon Valley Bank fails. I thought, <laughs> man, that might be it. Yeah. And it turned out that it wasn't. It wasn't it. So that's what causes a recession. Otherwise, what's going to happen is we're going to muddle along. We'll have some slower growth. We'll have some faster growth. But if the inflation rate stays high, then I think what you're going to continue to see, and this might be the, the murder weapon, is more social unrest. Uh, if you really want to see, you know, the the difference in the K-shaped economy where it's really big is in Europe. And what do and what do we all see all way too often in Europe is demonstrations and tear gas and police and riot gears trying to calm the masses. Look, France just had an election over the weekend, and the left won. The left won. And they still burn down Paris, hmm. you know, because they're so unhappy about what's going on in the, in the country right now. So if we don't get that recession or we don't get that um, 2%, then I just think the social divide is just going to continue to grow. Maybe that grows to the point that that is the murder weapon that causes a recession. Uh, but short of that, I don't think that the economy is going to roll over and it's just going to die. It die, you know, they don't die, you know, economic expansions don't die of old age. They're murdered. Something has to break it. 
is what it has to be. If you enjoyed all of that, then you'll absolutely love the Bankless newsletter. Join over 300,000 fellow readers, all for free. Click below to sign up.